Thanks for listening to today's episode of the Wayne County Chambers podcast for the record. We want to say a special thank you to our sponsors, Sport Durst of Goldsboro, Goldsboro Builder Supply, and Professional Data Management. The Sport Durst team is ready to get you into a beautiful new Volkswagen, offering open and honest pricing on every vehicle and service. Sport Durst of Goldsboro understands the value of your time and dollars. Providing quality building materials since 1953, Goldsboro Builder Supply is your premier destination for custom designs and excellent service to builders and contractors in Wayne County and surrounding areas. Professional data management offers specialized service and technologies designed to help you gain maximum reimbursements for the valuable services that your office provides. Another huge thank you to our in-kind sponsors, Daniels Furniture, University Lights of Goldsboro, and Johnson Carpet One, who together worked hard to make our beautiful podcast set what you see today. And for the record, we're glad you're here. In the upcoming episode, we'll be discussing conversations about substance abuse, its impact, and the recovery journey. This is a topic that may be sensitive to some. If you or someone you know is struggling with substance abuse, remember that help and support are available to you. We encourage our viewers to approach these conversations with empathy and understanding. So, Mr. Uh, Jeff Holtz, (laughs) let's talk about who you are. Uh, Tell the folks that I'm sure know anyway, but you, uh, what's your name? What are you... (laughs) Represent and what name am I using today? Okay, <laughs> your well, legal name. <laughs> well, well, I say that because it's so funny. Because my name is Brian Jeffrey Holt. Shut your mouth! I never knew that. Yeah, and matter of fact, when I was born, they put on my birth certificate Brain Jeffrey Holtz. Oh. And then my mother got mad. They fixed it. So ever since then, I had had a brain. Uh, so that's that makes, really a better problem. Yeah, that makes sense. But uh, so I go by Jeff Holtz. That's what I prefer. Some people call me some other names, but we'll leave out of this as a family production. And, uh, but uh, I was born in Goldsboro in uh, December 1955. Wow. Uh, Went to Walnut Street School, uh, elementary school, went to Goldsboro Junior High School then. They didn't have middle schools. Uh, That was back before the turn of the century. Mm. But, uh, and so then uh, went to Goldsboro High School and graduated there in 1973. That was a, that was a, wild time because the integration kicked in about the time I was in the ninth grade. Mm. And so, you know, everybody was, was concerned how that was going to go. We had consolidated the Dillard uh, campus with the Goldsboro high campus. Uh, you know, the Dillard tigers and the Goldsboro earthquakes became the Goldsboro Cougars. And it was, it, I had no problems during that. It was interesting, though, to sit there and watch it or be involved in it because you had a huge black membership of the high school and you had a huge white, and they had, a lot of things had to get sorted out. But I think the faculty and the um, uh, the administration and the students all that really cared about Goldsboro knew that was the that was the uh, hand we had drawn, and we went with it. There was, you know, some people were a little concerned about it, but. We just had a recent seminar, I think, at the library about the Wayne County Reads book about game changers. And Mm -hmm. that was part of, you know, getting through that, Mm -hmm. uh, those racial, not necessarily problems, but just dilemmas. Yeah. Can I, let me ask you just kind of a sidebar and get back to your introduction, you know. Oh, sorry. Uh, That's okay. But um, you having experienced that, I mean, when you look at race relations today, it's, I'm trying, I can't make sense of, it seems like we're at least, I was born in 1980. Yeah. And I feel like in my lifetime, this feels like the most challenging time since I've been living. You know, I can't, I can't agree with you more. Uh, Okay. You know, it was, it was the way it was supposed to be. The courts had ruled uh, that everyone is entitled to an equal education and, and the, the Congress and the presidents were all fighting for equal rights. And those, all those things went through. And, you know, in the 60s, we were like, okay, early 70s, we're making progress. And now it seems like the tide is going back out, not out, but going back in. And I'm, it's hard for me to get, understand that because it seems like uh, there's been a lot of human rights and civil rights that are starting to deteriorate again. It seems like we're going, in my opinion, it seems like we're going backwards instead of 
let's just embrace that we have differences and, and move forward. So I'm bothered by that, frankly. Yeah. And I would imagine in your line of work, it's something you've had to deal with in some direct ways too, right? I mean, well, absolutely. And, and you know, there, uh, uh, during COVID, of course, we, we had all the, um, problems with, uh, people's feelings about law enforcement and, and, um, um, black folks feeling bad that law enforcement and rightfully so in a lot of cases were out to get them. I haven't seen that personally here, but I know there are instances where people, regardless of, of whether they actually have been abused or treated differently, they're, they're, there's a perception that they're going to be treated different. That's something we need to work on. Um, so yeah, you asked me about what I do. You know, I left, uh, went off to UNC, my four years at Carolina, best six and a half of we my life. We won't hold that against uh, you. Well, I mean, I, right? be, just, be, be hard to, right? such a fine institution. <laughs> I loved it so much, I stayed six and a half years for, instead of four. But uh, <laughs> had a great time at Chapel Hill, took a couple years off and uh, from school and uh, worked in the legislature, uh, worked with my dad, brother, who were already attorneys. And then I, in 1982, I went to Campbell Law School and uh, got my law degree in 85, passed the bar, and have been back here in Goldsboro hitting, the, hitting it ever since. So uh, whatever that is, 38 years. 38 years. You have a lovely, lovely wife. Yes, I do. And she, you know, child bride. She's yeah. a few years younger than I am. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, she was a Goldsboro girl, had gone off to Meredith. Matter of fact, I I was here practicing law, and she would work at a gift shop here, and uh, like during uh, Easter break in the summer. What was the name of the gift shop? You Seabrook Collection. Okay. Uh, uh, the young lady Billy Esther ran that, and uh, Billy Esther Seymour. And you know, I'd pop in there. And one thing I liked about Lee was she knew my name was different. So she, if I did so, she goes, that's Jeff with a G. And I'm like, whoa, you're sharp. Right. And not to mention sharp looking and yeah. very smart. And so we kind of started a, a seeing each other um, um, and had a, had a lovely courting time. And about a year later, we got married in, uh, in October of 1987. Um, that was a, that was a tough time in my life, not, not being married. Let me get that straight. Uh, it was, as I always kid, it's been real easy on her, but tough will be all these years. Nobody buys that. But uh, my dad was my best man in October 3rd, 1987. And uh, he died December 6th of 87. And so I lost my dad just as we were, you know, kicking off our marriage. Um uh, and uh, my mother was still alive. She lived up until not 2014, which was a blessing. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about my brother probably in a little bit. But uh, my brother was practicing law. My sister, she went off to uh, college when I went to the uh, first grade. So she's 12 years older than I am. And she's retired in Abingdon, Virginia. But uh, Lee and I have enjoyed being a part of Goldsboro, you know, a lot of people are like, why would you come back to Goldsboro? You know, we both did it at different times. Mine was because my dad and brother had a law office and that's what I wanted to do and, you know, do general practice, but mainly criminal law, which is what I've kind of slid into more uh, firmly as uh, criminal and traffic. But, you know, we have family members who uh, wonder why we stayed here. And I'm happy we stayed here. There are very, a lot of reasons, but I love, we both love our hometown. And, and we raised two daughters here. Mm -hmm. uh, Hallie, who's a, a special needs teacher in Wayne County Public Schools. And uh, she's married to Ben Evans. And Ben was a graduate of a, a Wayne Community College, where I'm now on the board of trustees. Uh, he's a welder by trade. A bison. Yeah, 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 he's a bison, but he's an artist. He's yeah. got the, uh, the soul of an artist. And two years ago, they had a little boy named Norman Lee that mm. if you've been on Facebook and hadn't seen his picture, send me a friend request and you'll get about <laughs> 8,000 pictures of it. <laughs> uh, and my other daughter, Laura, both Hallie and Laura went to public school and Laura went to Carolina and uh, just finished law school last year at Carolina. Sorry. And uh, 
and is going to begin first of the year practicing law in District of Columbia. Wow. So we've had quite a beautiful life with, with some ups and downs. Yeah, yeah. Well, so um, I, I don't know that it's a capstone, but it feels like a capstone. You uh, became uh, the Cornerstone Award recipient, which is really the highest recognition that at least the Chamber of Commerce can can give a give out, and um, it's reserved for folks who've had a lifelong uh, impact on this community. And you were that you were the recipient this past year. Talk a little about that. What that meant to you, and well, yeah. what what was the anniversary of the chamber? Was it's that, 125 years. Yeah. So, well, well, I remember you suggested that maybe I'd been here for every year. I right? just, I mean, maybe. Come on. Yeah. Maybe it came up. I don't know. I'm, I'm still, you, I, I, I've gotten you, over it, really, Scott. <laughs> but no, uh, I look, I said it that night, and it, it was I, the, the pieces, the house of cards started falling as I realized that why my daughters were there, and you know how that goes. Mm-hmm. I knew something was something amiss. Was mm-hmm. But uh, it was still a one of the, probably one of the highest honors I've ever had because I love my hometown and I've tried to, I guess I was recognized for things that I've done, but I've done those things not thinking, you know, if I live long enough and I join enough organizations, I'll get the Cornerstone Award Can we one get, day. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that was the last thing on my mind those right. mornings, getting up early and going sure. down and you work with DGDC. I've worked with that, the Arts Council, been United Way chairman, uh, I uh, jumped out of a plane when we we uh, uh, hit the goal that year. I said uh, the headline of the paper was when they asked me what did I think about making the goal. I said, "Oh shoot!" <laughs> but that was spelled a certain way. But uh, you know, I went from being a I went from being a lawyer to being a paralegal when I jumped out of the plane. That's another oldie. Yeah, but I like uh, I've also been involved in a number of organizations. Right now, I'm on the board of trustees at the college, and I'm on the uh, uh, housing authority board and uh, friends of the library. And I do those things not, you know, to get a pat on the back. I do them because I like doing them and I like mm. being involved. And albeit I'll be 68 in December, I, I just don't feel like my time here has, is it's time to rest on any kind of laurels. I, but I was extremely pleased to get that, mainly because of the number of people that I looked up to over the years that have received that award in the past. And yeah. It's, they're credible people, and so I don't really know that I'm in that uh, in that company, but I'm honored to be there. I think I said that night, if if I'm a cornerstone, I kind of envision a building like the Leaning Tower of Pisa, you know, that <laughs> leaning over a little bit. But hey, yeah, I I was, and it was nice for my family to see that I got recognized too. Well, I I think in my world, you know, I'm uh, how old did you say you were? Sixty seven. Sixty seven. You know, I just turned forty three. And in my world, I do look at you as one of those people. You know, I think, um, you know, whatever community we have, whatever, you know, good we've seen, you know, a good, a great portion of that has been, you were part of the architect team of that, you know? Well, you know, community, volunteering and community service is just either, you know, when, when you start out doing it, you, you do probably do it to get your name out there a little bit. You know, Mm -hmm. I was Herb Holtz's boy. Mm -hmm. My dad was a well-known attorney, but, you know, he died, I said, in 87. So, you know, I said, he had taught me, you need to give back to your community. That's what lawyers do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and as things developed, uh, I was, uh, you know, one year I recall I was a state bar counselor, which is kind of the lawyer representative at the North Carolina State Bar, the governing uh, regulatory agency of lawyers throughout the state. That sounds official. Yeah, it was real official. <laughs> I was on there for nine years, and wow. uh, I was board of election chairman at the same time. I was involved in some other uh, United Way matters, and uh, um, and I was also, you know, which we'll probably talk about, had been in a few plays and done things. that That's, that's my hobby is... Uh, acting. I've had law enforcement officers say, I didn't know you were an actor. I said, did you see me in front of the jury the other day? <laughs> no, but... Uh, you're so dramatic. Yeah, so dramatic. <laughs> that sounds like my children talking to Dad, you're so dramatic. Quit yelling. I said, I just talk loud. You this, know? Is, uh, this is me. Yeah, but uh, so 
I can't say that I was like, I'm going to get dig in and be involved in all this stuff. You just do those things as it comes along. And then one day you wake up. I think I spoke at your uh, Leadership Wayne mm-hmm. a graduate class recently. I was like, I, all those things were read that I've been involved in. And I said, no wonder I'm so tired. You know, I just, you do those things, but you don't think about it at the time. Yeah. And, and, you know, you, uh, I guess too, you've, you've seen Goldsboro and Wayne County at different seasons. Yeah. You know, like I think that there's perspective that you probably bring that, you know, only someone who's had that experience can bring and been engaged for that period of time that, you know, what is it? The Einstein quote that says most of the change that we think we see is due to truths being in and out of favor. And I think that to see change occur means you've gone through cycles of, sure, you know, what people thought was good or bad at any given time. Well, and, you know, uh, our old buddy, Mayor King, he, he had, a, had a phrase for people that would be against, like, downtown Goldsboro redevelopment. Uh, you know, he called people, you know, anytime you try to do something positive, he, he said the people against it are cave people. Citizens against virtually everything. <laughs> and so you got to buck up with that because mm. they're going to be those people. That's right. And it shouldn't deter people from being involved. It makes it, a, actually, it makes it a little more fun when you yeah. know you can now look back. And I've had some people I wouldn't characterize as cave people, but that, that weren't necessarily all in on the downtown uh, sure. s- streetscape and all of that. And they were like, why are, we, why are we doing this? Why are we spending that money? And now they're like, Sorry, yeah. I see it now. And so, it, for instance, that is, that's just huge. When I was a little kid, downtown was, it was the place to be before we knew it was supposed to be the place to be. As a little kid, I was be downtown, and the downtown was packed, and the stores were full, and the Christmas parade, I can remember as a little kid, I mean, there was so much excitement, so many people. And then, you know, we hit that time where, People went to the mall and went other places, nothing against the mall, but it yeah. was just left not only kind of a decayed look to our downtown, it, uh, it, it just hurt me that I could walk downtown and it just looked like, you know, here comes another tumbleweed. Mm-hmm. And to see it come roaring back, mm-hmm. leadership of yourself, you know, Sherry, uh, uh, now Aaron, but of course, uh, Julie Betts. I mean, to see all of that happen, like you say, right in front of my eyes. Yeah. And now I go down there and I'm the old man going, I can't find a parking place. What's wrong <laughs> with this place? But that's a great thing. Yeah, that is great. Did you know that there are 1,947 parking spaces downtown? I didn't know how many, but I must have been 1,948. <laughs> <laughs> the other day, because it wasn't one. You're having to get your steps in. Is that yeah, what exactly. I hear you. I hear about you. a water tower, I think I'm done. <laughs> Sport Durst Volkswagen Mazda of Goldsboro is proud to support Wayne County Chamber of Commerce. Family owned and operated, Sport Durst knows the importance of keeping local money local and supporting the community. We put our customers first with the area's best pricing best trade-in value, and best selection of new and pre-owned vehicles. Come experience the Sport Durst difference, where customers and community come first. You've had this impressive career in law. You've had a great family. Um, You know, all, you know, now you're, you know, you're getting these accolades. I've seen that you've gotten some, you know, some of your, your, um, in the you know legal community has been uh, you know honoring you. And Realize how old you get when they start piling them on yeah. you. Yeah, but um, I imagine that it hasn't always been easy. So what, what was the hardest part? I mean, of all that, trying to balance. Well, being a being a criminal defense lawyer is a stressful job. Uh, you know, it's not all it's not all particularly uh, fun in games like television sometimes portrays it because mm-hmm. there's a lot of preparation. There's a lot of, you want the truth. Yeah. You can't handle the truth. truth. Uh, Lots of things uh, happen uh, in criminal defense and you, you're dealing with people and you're dealing with people that generally are not having their best days. 
And there are a lot of people I represent that I've represented over the years. I tried a lot of, I was on the court appointed list when I started out, tried a lot of murder cases, tried a lot of very serious felony cases. And, uh, you, you know, sometimes you're the only person there between them and going to jail or going to prison for a long time, maybe the rest of their life, even the death penalty. And, uh, so that, that, that stress is pretty intense. And, uh, so my outlet was generally my family and my community. And unfortunately, being a Southern lawyer, and shout out to Episcopalians, an Episcopalian, <laughs> that uh, I like to have a drink or 10. <laughs> and at some point, I mean, I'd always been a, what I considered a Southern hard drinking lawyer, criminal defense lawyer. Uh, I started becoming a, a person I didn't want to be, a embarrassment and a, and a not well-loved person at my own home. I'm talking about my home on, on Mulberry Street, not just the community. I was always lucky enough to, that people liked me, uh, but people that knew me that I was probably drinking too much, they weren't having to deal with my big mouth like in, at night or you know, dragging around the next morning and probably buttering to myself and everyone. And it was not who I really wanted to be. Um, so things really got bad. So how can we dig into that a little bit? Sure. Only with your permission, of you, course. Yeah, whatever. You're a sweet, I'm an open book. You're an open book. Um, how, you know, I imagine that there's, a, there's folks as we sit here and as we're having this conversation, they may listen to this and they may be struggling. Um, and you've been public about, you know, mm -hmm. your, your sobriety and that struggle, your recovery. But how do you recognize that you're an addict? How do you recognize that you have a problem? Like, how does that? Well, um, my particular disease, it's an addiction, but it's alcoholism. But it could be anything. There are a lot of addictive substances and behaviors out there. Uh, mine chiefly was, was alcohol. And uh, alcoholism is, or an addiction is basically the only disease that you have that tells you you don't have it. You can, peep, everybody who loves you, cares about you, can point out obvious things about you're not looking real good, you're you know, late for things, you're grouchy, you are probably, um, you know, just doing things you shouldn't be doing. And you're like, yeah, you know, I, I understand that alcohol is a problem, but I'm still in charge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Even though the tornado's kind of ripping the shingles off of the house. Right. And so... Things, you know, every, they say everybody reaches their own bottom at, 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 at a particular place or reaches a point where they just say enough's enough. Mine was publicized as well. Uh, you know, a year, about a year or so before that, if you'd like me to discuss that briefly about what happened, it was kind of my bottom. But I remember my wife, Lee, she, she told me one day she was going to go to Al-Anon, which is a group that helps family members deal with them. And I remember an alcoholic. And I said, honey, you can't do that. People will think I'm a drunk. And she said, sweetie, they are way ahead of you. Okay. Everybody mm -hmm. knows. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, you're like, Oh, that didn't feel good, right. but it was true. But still, I mean, I got a DWI. I got a DWI when I was chairman of the board of the chamber of commerce that year in 2008, that should have been enough. The, the, disappointment I'd see in my children when I'd promise that I wouldn't drink and then I'd drink again. Uh, you know, making fool of myself here and there. All of that should have been enough. It wasn't until uh, ill-fated day, October 1, 2008, uh, I had drank in a, drank in a while, uh, been in a couple months. You know, the thing about my, my alcoholism is I was a sick person. Because, you know, if it was a bad time, I wanted to drink. If it was a good time, I wanted to drink. 
And Lee and I were going to go out to the Wayne County Fair. And, and I, that day I just said, you know, I'm going to go out there and need a little social lubricant before I go out and shake hands with everybody. And as soon as she saw me, she, she knew I'd fallen off the wagon again. And I went around to uh, a local drinking establishment and kind of was in a blackout at that point. I got, I know now I was told to leave. So I've been thrown out of better dumps than this. What are you talking about? But I don't really remember that. Mm -hmm. And so these two good friends of mine, one of which was Kirk Keller, my old buddy, they took me home. And, and again, and luckily I was not a violent drunk, but I was a loud mouth drunk. I know that's hard for anybody that knows me to believe. And, uh, my wife called my brother Bruce over. We were, he was an attorney. He was a little older, but we were always kind of looking after each other, taking, taking care of each other. If something needed it. And, uh, during my blackout, he had a heart attack in my backyard and died. And so when I came out of that blackout, I didn't care about my family, my mother who lived two doors down, who was getting up at age, my girls, my community. All I wanted was a drink. I was at the gates of hell. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't kill Bruce, but there was even rumors of that surface, and it was on the news that lawyer may have been, be murdered his brother in the backyard. Bruce had a heart attack and died during apparently an argument we had while I was in a blackout. He has three beautiful children. I didn't care about them. So uh, some good friends of mine circled the wagons. Uh, Glenn Barfield, my law partner, Matt Delbridge, who's down to elected DA. Well, I mean, we'd gone to war for years, but he doesn't like me letting us out, but he's got a big heart when he, uh, he just has a big heart. I'll leave it at that. Leon Stockton was a good friend of mine, Dr. Stockton, and he was giving me some medication because I was just like, what, you know, I, I just thinking my whole life's over. I don't remember being suicidal or, or stating that I was suicidal, but my loved ones and my close friends, they all felt like it was, I was a danger to myself or others, maybe if I got behind the wheel of a car. So I was committed to Holly Hill uh, up in Raleigh. I stayed there a few days. I missed my brother's funeral. You know, I was still an alcoholic thinking I'm, Poor me, poor me, why am I stuck here? Can't even go to my brother's funeral. But I was exactly where I needed to be each step of the way. I give God all the credit for that. God's grace, uh, a decision was made that I go to a rehab facility down in near Atlanta named Mar. And uh, I... They said, well, you got to go for 90 days. I said, 90 days? I'm chairman of the Chamber of Commerce. I got a law practice. I got girls, one starting college and one got volleyball games. I, they're like, yeah, you just need to go. So I, I say that, I wanna, if I can, just say something real quick about, you know, my wife who'd been pulling for me, pulling, you know, tried every trick in the book to try to get me to quit drinking. You know, you can read the big book if you ever have somebody in your life that's got an addiction problem. You can read it. You go, wow. When she did go to al that time, some woman was talking about her husband and all the things he did. They said, my God, I thought Jeff had a second wife because the things that he was at, that her husband was acting out were very similar. Uh, the promises and the line about drinking and doing things. So. Lee wrote me a little card when I was getting ready to go. She and Tim Haithcock and Glenn Barfield drove me down to Atlanta, but she wrote me this little card. And I always remember it. Had a little, we had a little golden retriever, and she it was a puppy on this card, and it basically said, "If you have faith, one of two things will happen: either you'll have a solid footing on which to stand, or you'll learn how to fly." She said, "I got it here. You go." Look after yourself. 
And so, you know, everybody says, man, you're real brave and all to have gone down there and got help. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I was kind of, at that point, I was 52. I'll be at 50 years sober in October. Um, Lee Holtz is the real hero. Yeah. She, uh, she had to deal with the, <laughs> the family that was left behind. Bruce helped with Bruce's family, helped with our girls, run the house while I was gone for 90 days, look after my mom. Uh, so, and, and my girls, I give them credit too, because they were, they were fully support me in that. So, you know, uh, alcoholism is also a disease. It just t- rips a family apart. Yeah. There's always collateral, right? Collateral damage. Always. But you know, the good news is <laughs> get through that little part. I miss my brother terribly. Still want to pick up the phone when I think of some, some game on or something funny that I heard at the courthouse. Uh, I love his children, love his uh, wife, Betsy. Who, we just stayed at her cottage this this uh, last week for a little vacation. Um, the lucky thing, great God's grace has given me the ability. I didn't go fall off the edge of the earth like I thought I should or might would have considered. Uh, so I can pay, I can't change what happened. That's something that you got to get through up, up in your head. But I could be, you know, I can make amends. What I mean by that is daily. My family doesn't really have to worry about me doing something stupid. I mean, doing something stupid. I'm pretty <laughs> plugged in. <laughs> doing something stupid with alcohol. <laughs> You're fluent in. <laughs> I'm fluent in. in, in yeah. Ignorance is my own, should be on my wall. But, uh, so that's a gift. That's a motivation. It's a motivation for my family to see, hey, yeah, we didn't like, you know, we loved him, but we didn't like him very much there toward the end. And now I, I have a great relationship with my daughters and my son-in-law, my wife and my family, and particularly the little guy named Norman Lee, who I wouldn't even have been a member, part of his family now. And and if people say, God knows, Jeff Holtz quit putting pictures of that kid on Facebook. <laughs> well, one, that's not going to happen. Yeah. Two, I just feel so grateful that I've got that relationship with my whole family, but particularly that little boy. And he never knew me like that, and I wanted to keep it that way. Yeah. Well, and I when you know, as, a, as an observer, you know, looking from outside, looking in, it's like, well, I, you can feel. Like I can feel the love, you know, when I see not just the pictures, but just see, you know, the interactions between, you know, you and your children and you and your wife. And I'm like, that's, that's pretty cool. That is uh, faith and family and friends are the glue. You can have all of those things and still be an addict, an active addict but you're tearing it up. Now we all, I think we all recognize what could have been. Right. And so every day is kind of a, you know, it's a gift. That's why they call it the present as they say. That's good. Well, and I know that while your failure, you know, if that's what you want to call it, that low point was public. There's a lot of folks whose struggles, you know, they, you know, struggle with, all kinds of things, like you said. I mean, it could be alcoholism, it could be other things, but that that um, that journey of walking through in your own mind, like trying to do that dance of, um, you know, I'm struggling, but I don't know how to say I'm struggling, or I certainly don't want to admit it. And as as little publicity as my struggle can get, the better. In other words, I don't want light. I want to avoid the light on this particular issue. I want to pretend, you know, I, I get the sense having, you know, dealt with my own struggles or with struggles with people that I, you know, I know. We were talking with um, someone who was talking about suicide. He was talking about mental health and the challenge. And one of the things we talked about was, um, it seems like when you go through that, particularly you think about suicide, for example, right. um, 
it's like you get to the edge of a cliff. And when you get to the edge of a cliff, you, you lose perspective. You're looking in one place and one place only. You can't think past the moment. You know, you're stuck in this, this moment. And this moment is probably the worst season or worst moment in your own, you know, the burden of that. And, and it's like, if you could just, if someone could pull you back or yep. you could just step back and you could take a beat, you'd see the, you'd see the horizon, you know, you'd see that there's more to like, this is going to pass it, not saying it's not painful, not saying it's not difficult, but. Well, think, you've heard the phrase of uh, people that reach that point and, and go through with it. It's a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Yeah. And, uh, it's easy to say, I mean, I'm, I've had friends that have uh, lost their life at their own hands and, and by other diseases, maybe it could be connected to alcoholism. And you just say, man, I wish I, or ma'am, I wish I could have done something for you. You're right. It's a, uh, when you're doing it, you know, when I came back and I've told this story, if I may, uh, yeah. we, I can't, they allowed me to come home for Thanksgiving. They said, well, the big Turkey needs to be in <laughs> at home. And, uh, <laughs> when I was in rehab and I, like you said, I wasn't real keen on like getting out and saying everybody, I was like, wanted to be under the radar. Yeah. And Lee said, no. And, I, and if I haven't said it today, I'll make sure I say it. I got two higher powers, Jesus Christ and Lee Hulse. And if I follow their directions, usually I'm pretty good. But she said, we're going to church tomorrow for Thanksgiving. I'm like, nah, I don't think so. She said, yeah, you're going, bud. And we went. It wasn't a big crowd, but I went up and went to communion at the St. Stephen's Episcopal Church I've been going to since I was a baby. And when I came down from communion, every person in that church walked out to the aisle and gave me a hug. As I said earlier, I've been, I was kind of liked, even aside from my drinking. But they didn't just like me. They loved that I was doing something for myself yeah. and my family and my community. Yeah. Because I had people say, Jeff Holtz, if you could get a handle on this when I was still protesting that I really had that problem, thank all the people you could help. And I'm like, yeah, but when am I going to have a drink? You know, that's all I'm all thinking right. about. Sure. So a friend of mine said, well, my husband had certain things he can't eat. I said, yeah, but he gets to eat. And you're telling me I can't drink any kind of alcohol. It's kind of it's kind of bizarre to get to that point. And as you said earlier, you come back here, you know, rehab's kind of like Disneyland. You're not, nobody's offering you a drink down there. And you come back and you've been through a lot of therapy sessions and you've been through a lot of counseling and you've been working with other people that have a similar problem. And you come home and you're right around the corner from the same place that I just got thrown out of, you know, back in October of 2008. And you think, I just know how bad that's going to be if I do it. Mm -hmm. It isn't easy, sure, but it's worth it. Right. So the, the, um, the thing that is so impressive to me is to, I guess I see, I wasn't, I wasn't around this area. I didn't know that part. I've only just heard you talk about it. what I've seen is the other arc. Like I've seen the part, where I've seen the comeback, like, you know, I've seen, I mean, something powerful. And I, I guess talk to us about that. Like, I mean, how did, how do you persevere? How did you persevere to get to where you are today? I mean, when you talk, when we think about the word comeback, I, that's a powerful word. It I is. mean, well, As I said, my community, not just my family, my community really embraced me when I came back. I mean, I mean, when I was in rehab, I got so many letters from people that DAs that I'd been against, judges, people from my church, people, uh, our dear friend Julie. I mean, all these people in the community like, man, we can't wait to get you back. 
And so, you know, some guy said, man, you, you, what are you, the mayor of that town? I said, no, if I was a mayor, I wouldn't get this many cars. <laughs> but, <laughs> but don't you want to be? Uh, no, no, I'm very, very happy we have a kidding, great. Kidding, I'm a, kidding. Yeah, I, just, I got, we, have a, we got a lot of choices. Yeah. Uh, and the filing date's closed, so uh, that's good. So anyway, um, I just felt like I owed it to myself and my family and my community to say, okay, God, somehow didn't go the way I wanted because I miss my brother, but it's almost providential that it happened the way it happened. It was so intense when I came out of that blackout and my brother had died that he, if he had to go, and it sounds supernatural or whatever, I'm sorry, but he had to go. It was the right time for him to go for me because I was in such shock. And so I owed it to him, his family, my family, just people that stopped me on the street that I don't even know to this day that say, man, I'm proud of you or thanks for all you do. And I'm, you know, I'm like, do I? I don't know. I mean, I, I like still being involved in the community and I encourage others to be involved in the community, whether it's chamber of commerce or downtown or the college or the whatever arts council, housing authority, the library, there are millions of things for people out there to become involved in. And, and on that note, I mean, this is kind of a sidebar too, but don't you think there's been, it feels like there was an era where public service was kind of a thing, like people, people really engaged in that. There was a, there was a spirit of that where that was respected and, and, and appreciated. It does seem like um, the generation that we're in, and I don't mean, I'm not, it's not at a age of person, right. but just generally speaking, it seems like there's so much more distrust of public institutions, almost any of them, that people don't seem motivated to be connected to public service. Um, and if there's ever what we talked about earlier, and we may have different, everybody has different views on politics and all, but people that love their community, we might not can change tariffs or change treaties or get people in Congress to act like they're not seven years old. But we can make our corner of the world a little better place. And, and, and that needs to, to me, that overrides the cynicism that you might have. Well, uh, you can't trust them. You can't do that. Well, if you don't, so I'm local, get in there and make it better. Right. Uh, I have found, uh, you know, I, and I, I, one of my soapboxes is, everybody knows, well, everybody knows I'm a recovering alcoholic, so I'll say another one. I'm a, probably what they call a liberal trial lawyer. I don't disdain people who disagree with me. I might wonder sometimes, we may, then they may wonder the same about me, about why they think the way they do, but I'm not hateful about it. And I don't like people being hateful about my positions. Mm -hmm. And I generally think when people get together, like you and I here in this room and, mm -hmm. uh, at, you know, in, in a local restaurant or just bump into each other on the street or even at our church, you know, mm -hmm. everybody that goes to church, everybody believe the same thing. Right. Why not be nice? I mean, why not be, you can be forceful and you can have your positions, but why sure. have to be so negative? I hate hate, hate the negative. Well, and especially when people can't even seem to have conversations with each other. I mean, I, I, I feel like that in my, my life, and I imagine it's very similar, like you could be liberal, you could be conservative, you could be black, you could be white. If you're sitting at a table or you're sitting over coffee and you talk about 10 things, you're probably going to agree or pretty close to agree on about seven and a half of those. Amazing. I mean, like the, the number of things that people have in common is way more significant than the things they don't. Well, it, it, it seems like maybe no, I'm wrong. No, I mean, you and I agree. And I, I recall you, I don't know if you recall this, you and I both attended a, a 
there was a library function that had to do with a kind of a porch conversations. Oh, I do remember that. Do remember and that. we both, and I didn't know you as well, but we both, I said, you, 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 you were preaching that Uh-oh. and I was preaching it. And we looked at each other and kind of gave each other a grin. Like maybe we wouldn't have known we both felt that way, right. but that's the way it ought to be. It, the 12 step program that I'm involved in, if they say, if you, uh, love everybody at those meetings, you hadn't been to enough meetings. It's just not likely that you're going after you get to know some people, but you don't have to love everybody to be decent. That's right. You don't have to say, I'm going to take those two things that that person thinks that I think are completely asinine and remove any chance for us having an agreement on the 85, 90% of things that we think we all agree that could make the world and Goldsboro and Wayne County a better place. Yeah. And then, you know, you think, I mean, People are also very good at taking the snapshots of somebody's life where maybe it was their worst moment or a mistake they made and holding it against them forever. I mean, like, you know, like like everybody doesn't have that same challenge in their life. I mean, none of, nobody wants to be held responsible for the worst the worst day. Oh, yeah. Um, well, a lot of people I represent, truly. You know, I sound like I'm talking to a judge or a jury, but a lot of people I represent are good people that have a very bad day. Yeah. And whether it's a speeding ticket, whether it's some kind of behavior that they just, it was hot outside that day, we sure. can all identify with it, they blew up, something. Most people, I think, I might have trouble convincing other people, are inherently good and decent. Mm-hmm. And we all want to, you know, we all want to have a happy home. We want to have good schools. We want to have a be able safe, to afford our bills, pay our, know, bills, pay our bills, be safe in our communities, and care about each other, and not worry that some bad man's going to come in and and shoot us. I mean, all those kinds of things. So, yeah. I'm, you know, I talked a little earlier about you know coming along and uh, during integration. I mean. I guess it was the way my dad raised me because I did. I, there were people on both sides that were like, you know, I hate all of them and I hate all of them. But I'd say ninety percent, like we were just talking about. Well, let's let's get along. Let's make this Goldsboro High a better place, and let's make our community a better place. And some of my f- favorite people of my life were people I wouldn't have known had there been integration. Right. So you know, be a little open. Don't be so dialed in to just want to buck up at somebody. Yeah. And, and I, don't you think, um, I know you're a person of faith. You were talking about it earlier. I'm a person of faith. And yes, sir. I think, I think it does. I think that does influence people to how they view humanity, right? That they view things like, um, inherent value, you know, um, because we realize we didn't make ourselves right. That, so there's this belief that, you know, we're, that, that every person is a person of value. And I think it, there's also the belief that there's a such thing as redemption, that no matter who you are, everybody, you know, is entitled to a second chance, or at least we would hope that all of us would have the ability to extend redemption to another human being, given our own story, right? Well, uh, rare is the person who hasn't made a few mistakes right. and, you know, to condemn cause it's convenient people. Uh, you know, I, there's, there's, there's so much, and I'll say this and this may get some, some groans, but I don't have any problem with the, our country and our people, American people being a work in progress. I mean, I, I think if you ever draw the line and say, well, you know, America's tremendous right now and I don't want to change it one iota, I don't think that's what the founding fathers had in mind. I think they 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 gave us enough thought and gumption and, and, and permission to grow as a civilization and to be better. Because some of the things we're going through now like we said earlier, some I thought were already <laughs> had already been worked out, but we're having to deal with them again, unfortunately. But there are other problems, environment, relations of uh, ships with people that you some people may consider different than them. I mean, come on, folks. 
let's get on with it. Let's let's do, let's agree on the things we can agree on. And if we if you want to draw a line in the sand, great. But let's work on some stuff we can really do to make this a better place. And the chamber, I'm not just giving a shameless plug here. Please, shameless <laughs> plug away. You know what I mean? I know you've been you've been looking at me like shameless plug. Uh, no, but you know the chamber helps young businesses and people. I mean this recent uh, uh, event that we had downtown. We're helping mentoring new business owners. Oh yeah, launch launch Goldsboro. Oh, it was beautiful. <laughs> And there were people from across the spectrum there. Oh, yeah. Rural, city, black, white, yeah. young, old. Yeah. And I'm like, man, what a wonderful program to have going. And, you know, and if you, you're you out there, whether it's a personal problem, whether it's an addiction, whether it's a mental health question, whether it's I really would like to talk to somebody about how to make my business better, to make my school better. Reach out. Somebody, I bet, is waiting to give you some advice and some good advice. Well, and I think I've always said that to me, and part of this is my own life. You know, I became an entrepreneur, and I think, and I, we were po, you know, and um, <laughs> entrepreneurship to me is like one of the most leveling things that exists because you don't have to have education. Not, I'm not saying don't get it, but <laughs> right. you don't have to have it to be successful sure. in business. And so to me, it's like, it's one of the, it is very equal opportunity. Uh, not saying that it is, well, I shouldn't say equal because there are different challenges for different people. But um, the opportunity that entrepreneurship presents is something that Launch Goldsboro, I think, really is trying to, it, it just assumes that there are people with good ideas everywhere and it tries to get them to market. And that to me is about as fair as you can be. Right. And um, so I'm, you know, I do love that program. I love seeing it. Thank you for, well, no, being I, there. I, I, left there just feeling great about my community and i didn't have a lot i didn't have anything to do with it really i'm a member of rotary but and rotary was involved in it but i went just because i had to support rotary and i heard so much about it and i was blown away it was so beautiful yeah that's awesome so this stage of your life you're um you've, you've had this long uh experience you've had this arc uh what motivates you these days uh, believe it or not, and I give credit to some folks that like David Wheel, um, who's one of my heroes, folks that have are older than me and are still out there. Some of those exist. Yeah, yeah hard to believe. <laughs> yeah, Let, we'll get the slideshow out later. I'll prove it to you. Uh, yeah, but. <laughs> You know, some folks, Tommy Jarrett, Phil Bedour, I mean, they're not ancient, but they're they're a couple years older than me, and they're still involved in their businesses. They're involved as lawyers or entrepreneurs or uh, I see Steve Taylor. I'm not endorsing him. I'm just saying here's somebody who was superintendent of the schools and decided to keep giving back it, it, for being uh, running in a public office, and I encourage other people to run. Whether you don't like, if you don't like something, but to me, I'm not a, I'm not a, I don't foresee myself as a candidate. I see myself as just somebody who loves their hometown and has been given so many blessings and mainly the blessings have been a good career. Uh, I love doing what I do. I love helping people, love annoying my friends that are DAs and judges, <laughs> uh, but and I've worked with, you know, the courthouse family is just a huge part of my life. I heard my prayers every Sunday, just like my regular family and my community family are. I, so all of that, I would say, motivates me to keep going and to, you know, I, I hope I have a few more years. And and I like, we talk about Norman Lee, who's two, his his namesake, Norman Lee Edgerton, my father-in-law, my Mother-in-law, Susan Edgerton, they're both passed, like my mother, Rowena Hulse. I mean, that generation's gone. They did so much for me in the community in their time, in their day. My, you know, I don't, my day isn't over. I mean, when it's, when it's time, uh, 
it'll be obvious, hopefully, if it's either whether the fact that my health can't do it or I may pass away. I don't know. I don't want, I want to make sure I'm still doing something up to the last. But you are them to us, right? Well, like you, I, I Jeff Fultz is on that list to, to people like us. And I, I just want to say thank you for that. And we appreciate everything you do and every contribution you've made. And, um, you know, you probably wouldn't want me saying this, but, you know, I get to see the, some of the small acts of kindness that you've done for people, you know, just in my orbit of, of life, you know, the cards and the, and some gifts and just the words of encouragement. And, uh, it's not a show like you, it's the real deal. So I just, uh, I hey, that. thank you on behalf of the community. Can I say one more thing? Sure. Uh, I posted a quote the other day. It's funny. You know, you live to even be as old as me, Scott, <laughs> and new things you come across. Okay. It's hard to believe. But it was a quote of Abraham Lincoln, so I think it'd be a good one to maybe wrap this up. Okay. I like to see a man proud of the place in which he lives. I like to see a man live so that his place will be proud of him. Oh, that's good. That kind of some, I mean, I'm no Abe Lincoln, but I kind of sums up my feelings about my community and that I love so much. That's good. Mr. Jeff Holtz, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, old buddy. 